Hi, and welcome to Chapter 11. In Chapter 11, we're going to start working on database performance and query optimization. These are going to be ways that you can make your queries work better. It's really important when you're working with larger databases um, to make sure that your query works well. The more data you put in, the harder it's going to be to get the data out. So you have to make sure that your queries are as optimized as possible. Let's get started. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how are the queries actually created and what can we do kind of to make them better, the different directions we can move in. Understanding that a query starts generally from a client, either the SQL Studio, which counts as a client, or an application itself. The client will create the query and will submit it to the server. The server is your DBMS. Your server will receive the query, execute it, and then return the results, and then that will go back to the client who will receive the results. So this is how all, all queries work when you're getting data and putting them into something. The things that we can do to help our queries run better. We have some that are hardware and software constraints. These are things that give you limitations or things that you can optimize as well as you can. This would be your CPU, your RAM, obviously the amount of storage, and how fast your network is. Those are kind of your hardware constraints. When you build your server, um, these are kind of set in stone once you build it. I mean, you can obviously modify your server once you have it, but if you're using a cloud server, you might want to increase your CPU and your RAM because those are really important to your hardware. Obviously, software constraints. We're going to have the basic OS, wherever the, the operating system where the server is sitting. The network connection, again, can be counted kind of as a software um, constraint. And then the application itself. A lot of times, the biggest problem with our databases is not so much the database itself, but how the application uses it, how it gets its queries, how it gets its data. In the middle, we have database design because, as you know, the most important step in making sure your queries are good is the database design itself. Inside of data, data, database design, we can do either our SQL performance tuning, which is making sure that your query does the correct answer with the least amount of time and the minimum amount of resources. And then, of course, our DBMS performance tuning, which is actually changing the configurations of your DBMS to make sure that we can do the best we can. Let's talk about different steps in all of this. So starting with our DBMS architecture. So this is going to be the DBMS itself, and understanding how the DBMS is set up will help you to understand how your query is run and what we can do to make it more efficient. Starting on the um, left-hand side with our components and functions. When you, your DBA sets up your database, usually either they go with a default initial size or they can set the initial size of a data file, which will then be expanded by increments. So if I set a 4K file, I can say, and it can be expanded in 2K increments. A 4 megabyte file, I can say it can be expanded in 1 megabyte increments. We call these extents in the sense of we are extending our data file as we go along. So there's always going to be a default size that it starts at. When you have data that is actually stored on your hard drive, it can be in a single data file in rows of a single table, or it can be multiple rows from multiple tables. It depends on how big your file is and how much data space you need. So you can think of it as a single data file can hold all of your employees table or it could have a couple of files from your fields from your employees table and some from your salary table as well. So depending on how your DBMS is set up, we can have multiple ways of storing the same data. When we create our database, there is a default amount of, of data table groups that get created. We group them in about five or six levels. We have our system, where it stores all, stores all of our systems, similar to an operating system, how you have all of your system um, information stored when you install your operating system. Your user data, we have tables for our indexes, we have tables for our temporary tables. All of these are initialized with default sizes so that when the database is created, they all fill up a certain amount of space. All of those can increase as necessary. So as our database gets used and more data gets put into it, obviously the size of our database will increase. We have a cache. We have both the data cache and a buffer cache, and these are shared reserve memory that is used to store recently accessed data. So if you think about, I'm pulling data out of this table, I'm pulling data out of that table, those can go into a data cache 
so that the next time I go to pull data out, I don't have to go to the disk. I can just go to the cache to get it. And these are stored in RAM. They're stored in your, in your random access memory um, on your drive so that you don't have to go all the way to your hard drive. It's just you know, on the RAM in your computer so that you can get to it faster. Um, it is much faster to get stuff from your RAM than it is to get it from your hard drive. We also have our SQL and Procedure Cache, which is a cache of recently used SQL statements and recently used procedures, used exactly for the same reason as our data cache, because the theory being people are going to use the same queries over and over again. Why don't we just store the data in RAM rather than having to go back to the data files every time? So when we think about our I.O. requests, our input and output requests, remember your data has to be retrieved by an entire disk block. So your disk files, however big we decided to make them. Even if I only needed a single value, if I only needed one value, I needed to know what date John Doe started, I have to get the entire data block. And depending on how fast my connection is between my disk drive and my CPU, it might take a long time, whereas if that information is stored in RAM, it goes faster. Um, so just remember, storing stuff in cache versus storing stuff on your disk. We also have some processes, and each of these processes are built by your DBMS. It already does all of this for you, but you need to understand how it works. So there is a listener process that sits on your DBMS, and it sits there, and all it does is wait for user requests. It hangs out and it says, okay, I'm hanging out. Oh, look, somebody requested something. What do I do with it? He's kind of like the butler who stands at the door and determines where you go from one guy to another. Um, so your listener, all he does is wait for user requests and then pass them on. Your user processes manages the request for a single login for each session. When you log in with your login, whether you are an application or whether you're a user, that creates a session and the user process will determine all of those requests and handle them all within him, within his process, the user process. He'll keep track of everything that you do during that session. So he'll store every SQL query you run, every update you do, and he just kind of manages all of those. We have the scheduler and the lock manager, which we discussed in chapter 10, the scheduler, which organizes the execution and the lock manager, which manages your data locks. Those are both something we talked about in chapter 10, but those are different processes in your DBMS that handle when do SQL statements get, get run and how do we handle data. And finally, we have the optimizer, which is a process that will analyze your queries and find the most efficient way to run them. So he's going to look at your query and he's going to go, okay, we need to get this data out of this table and this data out of this table. What's the best way to do that? So when we talk about optimization, which is most of this chapter, we want to minimize our communication costs and maximize our execution time. We want our execution time um, to be the fastest. When I say maximized, it actually makes it the smallest. Um, so we want the fastest execution time and we want the smallest amount of communication costs. Every time you get data out of a table, it costs communication time. So this is called processing and data retrieval costs. And we go through those. We want to have those as little as possible. We'll talk about different ways of doing that. So there's three different things that we can do, modes that we can pick for our database that will help us to handle these optimizations of execution time and communication costs. First off, we can use manual versus automatic. Most of your DBMSs will be automatic until you change them otherwise. The DBMS will do all the hard work. The problem is, is that he has to use his own resources to figure that out, and that can take time. So sometimes your DBA will go in and actually schedule the optimization for you. You have to spend the energy writing it as a manual um, optimization, but it might be more efficient than whatever the DBMS will come up with on its own. We have two different ways of calculating that, that. We can either create it statically, which is when it's compiled. So if you have a SQL query or a transaction, it can go through and it can store that as a transaction. If the plan is determined at that point, at compile time, then it is called static. In other words, it's set in stone. We can run it five times and it's not going to change. If we had it dynamic, the plan will be calculated at execution time. So when is the transaction actually called and run? This is called runtime execution time. So as it's being run, it will determine the plan right before it runs it, as opposed to when it's stored and compiled. 
we also have the concept of using statistics. So if we want to use our database statistics to determine our best option, we can do that um, using a statistically based um, optimization mode. What that will do is it will look at the statistics of how long it took to get the table the last time we got it. How long did it take to run this query the last time? And figure out if there's something we can change to make it better. You can generate your statistics dynamically or manually. So you can go through and you can say generate my statistics now or you can have it dynamically where it'll automatically just generate your statistics on the fly. We also have the option of rule-based versus statistics. The statistics are going to use this, the statistic based is going to use the statistics to figure out what the best rules are. A rule based uses a set of user defined rules, which they use that to determine its best option. You know your data better than the database does because you're human. You built it. So you may know things that you want to do for optimization. You can do those in rule based and you can say, I want you to always run this query, call this first, call this where clause first, change these rules to make it so that this database gets as optimized as possible. All right, when we're processing a query, we go through three steps. The first step is called parsing. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look through the query, we're gonna validate the syntax. Is the syntax right? Did we forget a, an on statement? Did we not have our syntax correctly? This is kind of that pre-compile that you get in code where you get the squiggly lines. That's your syntax. We're going to validate all of the names and field names against the data dictionary. So we're going to run through and we're going to look at our, at our database and we're going to make sure, do all these tables exist? Are all these fields correct? Is everything spelled correctly? Okay, cool. We're going to validate user rights, making sure that your user has the ability to run this query. We give users individual rights. So you may have rights to certain tables and not others. You may have rights to certain databases and not others. You may have select rights, but not create or update rights. So we need to validate and make sure that this query can be run by this user. Then we're going to run into our atomic components and we're going to analyze those and break it down into individual components that need to be determined as we're going along. So we kind of break it down into, I need this piece of information and this piece of information. We're going to do the best we can at this point to optimize it for efficiency and we're going to come up with our execution plan. This is the important part. The computer will do this, but understanding how it does it will help you to write better queries. Once we've determined our execution plan, we're going to go execution. Execution will run all of your locks, so all of your IO operations will be executed. We're going to go get the information that we need. We're going to do the locks as we need to. The data is going to be retrieved and pulled into cache and then all the transaction management is processed. So we do the entire transaction at this point and we get everything and then we undo our locks. Finally, the last step is figuring out what does the user actually want at the end. This is kind of the select statement, the sorting statements, the grouped by, and the aggregates. They happen last. So our execution statement is going to do our from clauses and our where clauses. So it's going to get the data, but the actual determining which fields are coming out, what's retrieved, how it's sorted and grouped and aggregated, that happens in the fetching stage. Then the rows are returned to the client and um, data can be returned in blocks. Some of the SQL databases or um, the DBMSs are going to return 100 rows at a time. They do this so that it doesn't, um, if it's a large data set, it doesn't fill up the network with that data set. It'll return 100, then another 100, another 100 until you fill up entirely. This is um, done for efficiency state. Sometimes when you write a query, you end up with a bottleneck. Bottlenecks are where delays are introduced, usually during I.O., that causes everything to slow down. These can be because of lack of CPU. We're trying to do too much too fast and there's just not enough CPU to do it. Lack of RAM. We, don't, we can't get the data in and out fast enough and it just goes really slow because we're waiting for data. The actual hard disk itself how long does it take to get the data from the hard disk? Is there a problem with the hard disk? Is it having a hard time storing the data or retrieving the data? The network speed, if you're getting stuff from the cloud, if you're getting stuff across the network, is that going to slow you down? Whether or not you have indexes um, or indices to be able to do that query, if we didn't have indexes, it makes the table queries go a, little fat, a lot slower. Um, data locks, obviously, those are going to be a problem. And then the application itself, sometimes the application can cause problems in the background as well. It's sending too many requests. It's not waiting for the request to come back. It is waiting for the request to come back, but something else hasn't yet. 
lots of different things can cause a query bottleneck. So a bottleneck thinking when you're looking at a wine bottle, it's really big and fat down at the bottom and then it comes up to a neck, which is really, really small. Only a certain amount of information can go through that neck at a time and it gets all backed up. We like to avoid this. So we've talked about indexes a lot. Indexes are great because they help our database know what we want to look for before we've actually looked for it. There are three different types of indexes that you can add. The important concept when we work with indexes is data sparsity. Is it sparse? Now the sparsity simply says how many different values is a column allowed to have? So if I said state field, the state, I'm allowed to have about 50. You know, you could add in Puerto Rico and, and Dominican Republic and a couple of other things if you want to include Washington, D.C. Um, so 55, 60, somewhere in there. Um, but you're not going to get more than that. It's not going to be much more. Whereas if we had a Boolean field that was like an is admin, you have two options, on or off. These are your only two. When you look at data sparsity, when you're determining indexes, you can change your index type based on the sparsity. So the first index type that we talk about is a hash index. What we do with a hash index is we take the value that we're looking for, the, the values that exist in the table, and we store them as an ordered list of hash values. So we're going to use a, a hash encoding to be able to, um, to hash your data into a value. That value is now, instead of a string, it's now a number for all intents and purposes, and it can be searched as such. So it can be ordered and searched. So if I'm looking for a string and I have to look through each character, that takes a lot of effort. But if I'm looking through a hash table to figure things out, that goes a lot faster. Hash indexes work great when you are comparing equality. I want to say, is it equal? They don't work so well when you're doing inequalities, likes, betweens, or less thans, or, or, or greater thans. Um, because you've turned this into a number, and it's ordered, and it's sorted, and it's beautiful, but being able to say, is anything like this? Well, that doesn't really work. So that's not going to give you as much work if you're going to be using that field for inequalities. If you're using it for equalities, do your hash index. It's beautiful. The other option that we have is called a B tree. So a B tree creates an upside down um, tree, which is listed here. And it's going to form a sorted list with the top as the median value. So we're going to have the customer table given here. And we're going to find that guy who sits in the middle. And we're going to put him there. And then apparently this is alphabetized. So we're going to put him on that side. And then everything over on the left side um, will be greater than. And everything on the right side will be less than. Then we're going to go down another level and we're going to do this into quarters. Each one of these quarters, each one of the leaves, um, can create a different index and you only have to go down one, two, three, four, five levels instead of looking through 400 records. So every time you do a B tree, you're splitting your, your count in half, which makes it so much faster. The other option that we use is a bitmap index, and this is the index that we use when things are very low data sparsity. There's only a few possible values. High data sparsity, we're using our B tree. Low data sparsity, we're using our bitmap. So in this case, we have our region code where we only have northwest, southwest, um, northeast, and southeast. There's only four options. So we're going to make a bitmap index with four columns, one for each of those. And each different row is going to have the option of a one or a zero. You can only have one value in there because this isn't a multi-value um, field. So when I do a search, all I have to do is say all of the ones that are ones for Northwest. And suddenly I can really quickly get that. If I was to try to search this with a string where it's equal to Northwest, that's not going to work as well. So in this case, a bitmap index is going to be able to give you that indice, breaking it down into quarters really fast and returning the values that you need. So data sparsity, how many possible options is it sparse? Um, if you're looking at a, a forest and there's three trees, there's three options, that's really sparse. The opposite of sparse would be dense. There's a lot of different options. If there's 500 trees in there, that would be dense. That is not sparse. So if you have 500 options, that would be dense, not sparse data sparsity of um, low data sparsity, small data sparsity, is going to be just a few values.
When we build our optimizer, we can choose if we want to use that rule-based optimizer or a cost-based op optimizer. Our rule-based optimizer will use a preset rules that the user or the DBA is going to create. The rule-based will assign a fixed cost to each SQL operation. A select statement with a string might be a 10 and a um, select statement with a Boolean might be a three. Um, a create might be a 15. Depends on what SQL operation you're gonna do to determine um, what each cost is gonna be. This doesn't usually take into account as much how many records there are. It will just say that different types of operations will have different costs. And then we're gonna use those costs to create a plan. When we do a plan, we think of all the different ways that we could do this. Okay, I'm gonna get these options first, then I'm gonna do that one, then I'm gonna do this third thing. Oh wait, no, I'm gonna do the third thing first, then the first thing, then the second thing. Different ways that you could do it. And as you can see from the um, chart here, this is a way of comparing your access plans and then your IO costs. So the cost-based optimizer, which is what this one is a little bit more, based, the graph's a little bit more based on, uses information about the objects, the individual tables, to create the best approach. It will use that processing cost, the I.O. cost, and then the resource cost to come up with a cost. Um, and it determines the cost of multiple choices and then goes and picks the lowest one. So it's just like going and shopping. So in this case, we have two plans. We have A and B. A is going to do three steps where it's going to do a Cartesian product between a product and a vendor. Then it's going to select all of the rows um, in that that match the vendor codes and then they're going to check the ones that all have the same state and in this case we have 2.1 million for our io cost in plan b we decided to select the rows from vendor that are in florida first which is not too expensive because it doesn't create that many resulting rows then we're going to do the cartesian product then we're going to select the rows um, where they have matching vendor codes and you can see that we only had 77,000 for our io cost so that was a cheaper cost we're going to do it that way Depending on how you write your query will lean towards one way or the other. But a lot of times you can write your queries in multiple ways and the optimizer will usually figure out how to move things around so that it's optimized. All right, so in the textbook we talk about hints. Hints are ways to give special instructions to the optimizer just to make sure that it knows what's going on. We can do a hint that tells the optimizer you're gonna be getting all of the rows. So um, we're gonna select all of the different rows instead of um, just some of the rows. And this tells the optimizer to minimize the execution time, um, minimize the time needed, knowing that this is being done. We can say we only want the first rows. So it knows we only have to get the first set of rows for this, so change your optimization knowing that we only are gonna get the first rows on that. Um, and then of course, using a specific index, we can tell the optimizer, I want you to use this index when you're doing this. So in this case, we have the quantity on hand index. I want you to use the quality on hand index when you're checking this. Sometimes the computer gets confused and it looks at it and goes, well, maybe I don't need to use an index. No, I'd like you to use the index. I'm gonna give you some hints to make you pick the right choices. All right, we're gonna do two slides on performance tuning. So this is the first which gives us index selectivity. Is it going to be likely that we need to use an index? So the index, indexes, indices um, will be used when the indexed column appears either in the search criteria, so in your where or your having, in your group by or your order by, in your min or your max for aggregates, and if the data sparsity on the indexed column is high. Remember, if the sparsity is low, we may not be ending up using the, the index. The interesting thing about this one is that for min and max, we may not need to get a whole lot of data, so we're gonna use our indexes to get it up until a certain point. For sum and average and count, we need to do a table scan anyway that goes through all of our table. So there's no point using an index when you're gonna do a table scan, so we don't worry about indexes in that case but you do want to use indexes in the searching and then of course the grouping and order by. When you create an index, you want to create an index in every attribute that is used in either the where having group by or order by. Always. Just every time you're going to have a where having group by or order by, make sure you add an index. 
Um, don't use indexes though if you have small tables or low sparsity. This is where it gets a little weird. So I just said use it every time, except, so use the word except in this case. If your table is very small or it has a very low sparsity, remember it doesn't have that many possible options, don't bother with an index because the expense of using an index is not going to get canceled out by the decreased time of using the indexed value. Essentially, it's not worth it. By the time you get the data, it was just as easy to use it without an index, and using the index might actually take more time. You always want to use your primary key and foreign keys, um, which will be indexed automatically. When you, when you tell the computer to make them a primary key or foreign key, they'll get indexed. That's just an automatic thing. And then make sure that you declare indexes for any column that is used in a join that isn't a primary key or a foreign key. So remember, primary keys are already done automatically, but if you know you're going to be joining on other keys, why would you? It happens. Normally, you'd be joining on foreign keys. That's what they're there for. But sometimes it happens that you're going to be doing a join on something that isn't a foreign key. That's okay. Just make sure that you always declare an index for those fields as well. Indexes are going to tell the computer or tell the DBMS, hey, I'm going to be using these two fields a lot. Make sure you know what they are. Keep those in RAM. Keep those close by because you're going to use them a lot. When databases were first made, they did not have the option of a function-based index. They do now. They've updated it in the last 10 years or so. So if you have a function, user device function that you want to use, you can index that function. If it's a function that you're going to use a lot, go ahead and index it. Again, it should make your, your code faster unless it's a low sparsity issue. Okay, so this is your index selectivity, should you use an index. The other perf part of, of performance tuning is dealing with conditionals. And this is a really important thing when you're building your queries. A couple of different things here that I want to go over because I want to make sure that you understand the different parts of it. The first one is use simple columns or literals in conditionals. If you can, Calculate your values prior to your query. This goes back to like coding. Remember when you first did coding and you could do a conditional and you could throw in an expression inside of a conditional like is x greater than or equal to 5 plus 3 plus 7. Some, I don't know, some sort of, of, of um, expression. And every time it went through that if statement, it would have to recalculate it. Same kind of concept. If you can get calculated values as literals, before you write the query, it will go faster. If it has to calculate that value, that takes another, another piece of information, another processing cost. So try to always calculate your values. When you're writing transactions, you can always declare a variable and set the value prior to your SQL statement so that you do have a literal value um, or something that is a single value at that point. Remember, numeric fields are always faster than characters, dates, and nulls. Um, characters and dates, they have to do a search per character, so it's hard. And even with dates, you have to do multiple searches to do. The interesting one on this one is nulls. Nulls are actually the slowest operands because they involve extra processing. I'm going to repeat that because it seems counterintuitive. Nulls are the slowest operands. So is null, is not null. When you store null data in your database, the database has to handle it differently. It doesn't handle it the way it handles a numeric field, which means a bit, zero and one, is a whole lot better than leaving a, a null value in there. Because a null value, not only does it have to say, is it null, it has to go through some extra processing to say, how do I handle the fact that it's null and get that value? And it actually makes it the slowest of all of the operations. Equality is always more efficient than inequality. So equal to rather than not equal to, um, greater than and equal to, less than and equal to. Those are always going to be less efficient than a basic equality. So if you can turn it into an equality, that is always faster. A like, so the one with the, um, the percent signs that goes with like strings, is almost as slow as a null. Not quite, but it's close. It is a very slow operation to do to be able to use that like. You can do it, but be careful. You want to try to do the best you can not to use it if you can avoid it. Um, when you have multiple conditions, if you have 
where this and this and this, so multiple conditions. Make sure you always put the ones that are equal before the inequalities, and it will process those equal ones to get the count of, of return values first, and then your inequality ones, which will take more time, but hopefully by this point you have less records to go through. If it's possible, transform your conditional expressions into literal values. So there was an example in the book of price minus 10 has to be less than 7. Well, you can turn that into price is less than 17. That isn't even a hard thing to do. And it is much faster than trying to have the conditional expression have an, an additional expression price minus 10 every time it goes through. So if you can do that, always try to transform those into literal values. If you use multiple ands, put the most likely false value first. Remember, with an and, it will keep processing until it hits its first false. Because all, all the values, if you have multiple ands, all the values have to be true. So it will look at the first um, condition. If that's false, it'll just stop and move on. If that's true, it'll go to the second value. And if that's false, it'll stop and go on. And then it looks at the third value or the third condition. And if that's false, then it goes on. Otherwise, if it's true, then we move on to the, um, the true case. So when you do and, if you remember your truth tables from ands, the most likely false first means that we will fall out of it first. And that's really important. Fun thing with or, it's the other direction. Remember with an or, any of the three can be true. So put your most likely true first. So if I again have three conditions, check the first one. If the first one's true, I don't even have to check the other two conditions. I can just keep moving and go with my true statement. So be careful with your ands and your ors. Again, you want to put your equalities first of those, but you also want to pick the most likely, either false or true, if you've got multiple. The last one on this one is the not operator. So the logical not is pretty expensive. Um, it goes through and it finds all of the ones that are price is greater than 10, and then essentially has to go through and do a comparison with the record set to get anything that wasn't not in that section, because we have to flip it, get all the rest of the values, and it's confusing. Don't use the not if you can avoid it. So, and, and a lot of people, when they're doing their logic, will end up with a not that they don't really need. You can change it. Obviously, not price is greater than 10 could be prices less than or equal to 10. So you can flip it around. Most of your nots can be flipped around pretty easily. Okay. So when you're trying to build your query, it's important that you follow a couple of good steps. First off, figure out what columns and computations do you need. Do you need to do an aggregate? Do you need to do a subquery? Or is it a simple select? Figure those out first. Figure out where your source tables are. And this could also be a subquery issue of, do I need to use a subquery for a source table or can I just use tables? And following that quickly is determining your joins. Once you figured out all of the columns that you need, figured out what all your source tables were, now go figure out how everything's connected. Look at your joins. Go look back at your ERD. Make sure you understand where things are joined. The fourth one is determining what do you want to select. Are we doing a straight where, which is just a, a regular where simple comparison? Are we doing a single value to multiple values, like an in? Is this value in this group? Are we doing a nested comparison with a subquery? Is this in the subquery? Um, and then are we doing a grouping data? Are we going to select groups of data? So using the having clause. Um, and this goes again with aggregates. So figure out where your collect criteria is. And then finally, figure out your order for your output. Deal with your order by last. That is so last on your list. Make sure you get the other parts done first. Okay, so when you build a new query, this is how you start it. You go, what are the columns and computations I need? What are my tables? Where are my joins? And then you can kind of start building it from that piece of information. Once you can build your, um, your joins, you know whether you have subqueries in there because you've already kind of thought about it. All right. At the server level, and we are not going to talk a lot about the server, there's a couple of things that you need to think about when you're doing your DBMS tuning at the server side. The first is those cache values. Again, we have a data cache. We need it to be large enough to permit as many requests as possible. There are some data caches that are huge, you know, a couple of gigabytes, because they want to allow the user to have as much data available at one time. Remember, your data cache is shared among all of your users. 
Again, if you have 10 users versus one user, you might want to have a bigger cache. This needs to be a, a place of storage that it can hold the data, so you need to have enough available. You want to have your SQL cache, which stores your recently executed SQL statements. If a lot of the users are asking for the same thing, this way the query only has to be run once, and it can keep returning the cached value instead of rerunning it. Sometimes that can be a problem. If your database did not recognize that something had been changed, usually it fixes that and it, and it recognizes I did a SQL cache on a query that referenced values that have now been changed, updated or, or um, something along those lines. But you will have some caching errors if you do um, your SQL cache, which is great. SQL caches are wonderful, don't get me wrong. Um, but recognize that it is possible in some cases to have that not updated. Your sorting cache, which is just a temporary storage that holds the order by and the group by operator or operations. Understanding every time that you do a sort, you're going to be running some sort of an operation that says, take this value and compare it to that value and then return whether or not, remember when we talked about binary sorting back in programming, back in Java, um, the option of how it needs to get sorted. That needs to be stored somewhere. So when we have a sort cache, that holds those operations for your sorting and your group by. And then of course your optimizer mode. Are you using the cost based or the rule based? Are you gonna have your DBMS come up with all your rules? Or are you going to use the cost option for each of the different transactions? So figure out which mode you want to pick for your DBMS. All right, the other thing having to do with your DBMS is the actual physical storage options. When you have the choice of a physical storage, you can choose to use a solid state drive, which is your SSD, which is a lot faster for I.O. than your regular hard drive. We can call these I.O. accelerators because they help accelerate your I.O. a lot faster. The drives are not spinning and they actually do I.O. a lot faster. You can choose a RAID drive, which is a redundant array of independent disks. That's always a fun one. Um, there are some lists in the book on the different um, styles of RAID. I think that's part of your homework, actually. So make sure you go back to the book and look that up and understand about how RAID drives are done. Um, RAID drives are multiple disks that create kind of a virtual storage that do a lot of fault um, or a lot of improved performance, but they're also really fault tolerant. They don't break um, because they're designed to be used really well in systems that need to be really fault tolerant. So you might have some duplication of data. Um, you might have multiple disks that store the same data so that there's another place that you can look if this one's spinning. It's okay. Go look at that one instead. Lots of things you can do with RAID drives. We want to minimize our disk contention. So sometimes we like to store database on multiple independent storage volumes so that we can minimize the hard disk cycles, which means individually, which hard disk are we going to? Which cycle are we looking at? And how many times does that get hit? So when you store your data in different storage locations, you can look at it as, I need this piece of information, I go there. This piece of information, I go somewhere else. And it decreases the, um, pressure on the individual disk. So there's no contention of fighting over which disk. In Oracle, we use something called an index organized table. In SQL Server, it's called a clustered index table. Both of them are the same thing. They store your end user data and indexes to consecutive locations. Putting those back to back increases your performance advantage because when the system is searching through the data it just has to go from one straight to the other and it doesn't have to move around and that makes it faster. Sometimes we assign separate data files to separate storage for indexes or um, system tables and then for our high usage tables. If we have a table that gets used all the time and then we have tables that aren't used very often at all we want to keep that high usage table in a different place than the other tables so that when we pull stuff out of it, it's not competing with the, the small little requests. It's used to that connection. Your caches will come in there. Sometimes we can partition our tables um, based on our usage. And then these two are kind of fun. You can always denormalize your tables. Now, I know we said normalization was great, but we also said normalization is not the end all be all. Sometimes it's much faster to denormalize some data and to unnormalize some of it so that you have the data available rather than having to do a separate join. Again, sometimes you can store your computed or aggregated values in a table. Kills me to do this, but sometimes it's more efficient to have the totals calculated every time that you have a trigger when something gets inserted and store that rather than trying to calculate it every time you run a query. 
If I run a query that says, what is the invoice total? Well, yes, I can go and get all of the line items and all of their, their quantities and figure out their individual prices, then add all of those up and sum them and get that every single time I want an invoice total. Sometimes that's not worth it. It's better to have a trigger that every time a line item is added or updated that it will update the invoice total for you. So those are okay. So sometimes it's better to have them in a table than to calculate them each time. All right, so that was database performance. Um, a couple of summary concepts. Remember, performance tuning is simply the activities to ensure that the user gets his data as fast as can. Database statistics are measurements to describe the object's characteristics, essentially different pieces of information about the object, how many records it has, how many fields it has, how much data it's holding, um, things like that. What is the um, sparsity of the data? Those kind of characteristics go into your statistics. Your query process will always be parse, execute, fetch. So parse to break down the query into groups execute to run those individual um, statements, and then fetch to get the record results and do and sort in and grouping. Indexes, so important. Please add indexes. Um, when you write your query optimization, you can use your rule-based from the preset user rules, or you can use your cost-based, which adds together your IO, your processing costs, and your resources costs. When we do our SQL performance tuning, make sure you write your queries to make the best use of your indexes. That was kind of the main thing to remember there. Um, query formulation, how do you translate your business rules into queries? Wouldn't that have been useful a couple of chapters ago when we had to write queries? Now you know how you're supposed to do it. You break it down into what is the fields that I need, what is the data that I need, figure out which tables you need, um, figure out where your joins are, deal with your, um, your criteria, your select, your having, um, whether you have to use an in or you have to use a subquery, and then finally deal with your ordering last. The last one, of course, was on performance tuning to manage your memory and your physical storage. Okay, let's deal with your homework. All right, so again, I'm going to request that you do all of the review questions. Yes, there's 15 of them. Um, I, I don't expect, again, full big paragraphs, a couple of sentences max should be fine for most of these review questions. For the problems, one through six are kind of combined together. There are a couple of different um, queries and asking you about how you would, would make it better. Everything after that, 7 through 12, all use the SailCo database. Um, the ERDs in the book on page 549, I have added the um, insert statements, the create statements, um, that SQL file to D2L. So you should be able to go in there and get out those files. Um, I, you may want to drop the existing and insert the new one at this point because they have altered a little bit since chapter, five, chapter 10. So I've asked for 7 through 10, then 11 through 13. You don't have to do 14. It's on how to create statistics. Um, and in SQL Server, it's a little bit different than the answer that's in the book, which is on Oracle. But we don't have to worry about 14, so I'm not really worried about you creating your own statistics. And then 27 through 32 is two more groups of queries with questions that go along with them. So mostly 7 through 32 are all asking you questions about queries. How would you make them better? Where would you put the indices? Do you want an index? Why or why not? Those type of questions. Okay, have fun with this one. This is actually, I would bet, as a database designer, um, one of the more important chapters on figuring out how to make your queries work well long term. As the data starts filling up, as more people use it, your query speed is going to be more and more important. So obviously the most important is, is design. Database design is obviously the most important, hands down. But being able to optimize your queries is coming in probably a pretty close two or three. It's an important part of it. So have a great week, and I will talk to you soon.